This will be an example of an improper integral, one of the types, uh, one of the multiple types of improper integrals. And I want to motivate it with a very rough sketch of a electrostatics problem. Uh, and because partly what I want to talk about is why would you do improper integrals and they involve limits and infinity and sometimes they seem very formal but they're actually very well motivated from a lot of uh, applications. So suppose you want to, you have a, um, a long thin rod that has some uniform positive charge on it and it's, this is supposed to indicate that it really goes on way out of the picture, it's quite long. And you're a fixed distance, let's say distance one unit away from the end of the rod perpendicularly and there's going to be an electric field pointing up and to the left from this, um, pointing away from all those positive charges. It's going to have an x component and a y component, and it turns out that if you just focus on that x component, um, it's going to be proportional to an integral. And I'm going to taking out all the physical constants, but it's going to be an integral um, of a certain function, x over x squared plus 1 to the 3 halves, basically along the rod from zero to however the wherever the rod ends, in other words t. And so t is going to be the length of the rod. And in very many situations you want to idealize and simplify. If it's a really long rod, I don't want um, to pay attention to the exact length of the rod. And I have might have this suspicion that if uh, the rod is really, really long, this answer might not actually be that sensitive to exactly how long it is. Because if I add a little bit of, of uh, length way, way away, it's not going to have a big effect on this point because the, the field, the contribution of the field is getting going down. So um, that is correct intuition, and we'll actually see that. Um, so the way we formalize that is that we idealize it as infinitely long, but just off to the right. And we're going to write it, the resulting integral, as something that sometimes looks weird the first time you see it, but it's really just a, another great example of using in, losing a limit process. We'll see how we define this with a limit in a second. Um, and this symbolism of infinity to just make our life simpler, and usually in a somewhat idealized way. Um, so what's the actual definition of this? Well, it actually just, you just ask a mathematician, well, what did I just describe? I described a process of something that does depend on t. Depending on exactly how big this t is, you're going to get different numbers. It's going to be a function of t, but I'm interested in the trend as t gets really, really, really big, and I'm hoping that that actually uh, stabilizes towards a finite number. Well, that's exactly the limit as t goes to infinity of the integral from 0 to t. So you take the meaningful expression, the integral over a finite interval, using a, a finite rod, but then you just see what the trend is when that rod gets longer and longer. So this is, this is our first example of an improper integral. They get written in this way with a symbolism of infinity in the limit, um, but they're carefully defined uh, uh, as a limit as t goes to infinity of uh, an actual integral over a finite region. And these we often know how to do, not always, um, and then we can take the limit at the end. Now, the further you go in improper integrals, the eventually you kind of drop always going back to the definition, and <clears throat> you learn to manipulate them as their own gadgets, but the definition is always going back to a limit. And if you ever need to be careful, this is how to do it. And we're going to try to be careful pretty consistently um, as we go. So, um, there's a couple of strategies for, if you have to use a technique of integration here, for example, if you have to use a substitution, there's a couple of ways to do that. I'll show, um, I think what the book would probably want us to do, and maybe a little more straightforward to people, um, and then I'll show you an alternate way. So, um, because we, we've got a definite integral, and we're going to be making a u sub here. We're going to do a u, u equals x squared plus 1 here, and it's not going to be a hard integral. Now, when we do a u sub in a definite integral, we usually change everything, the, every in instance of x and the dx, the differential, and the limits into the new variable. When this has an, a separately variable quantity itself, that can be a little weird. It's totally legal, and that'll be my second way of doing it. But um, we might want to do the other strategy, which in more simple situations is a waste of time. 
but here we might want to go back to an indefinite integral and just say, okay, what is the indefinite of integral? Get that really clear, get a function of x, and then just evaluate that at 0 and t and then take the limit. Okay, so this is where we're going to do our u sub x squared plus 1 du is 2x dx. And so I do have an x dx. I usually want to try and get an as exact a match as possible to make sure I'm not screwing up the constants and all that kind of stuff. Okay, that's good. All right, looks like I'm ready to roll here. This is the integral of, let's see, the one half will come out, of du over u to the three halves. Well, you know, I really should write that as a negative exponent. That's u to the minus three halves du. And that's pretty good. That's one half, and then that's times minus two u to the minus one half plus c, but that's going to go away as soon as we make it, as soon as we start evaluating it. And then we just get a nice cancellation. Minus, so it's really, really nice. U to the minus one half plus c. Now, because I'm doing this as an indefinite integral, I am going to take it back to the original variable. And so that's just minus one. And I'll rewrite it with the, uh, as a, denominator as a fraction, but you don't have to. Okay, so there's our indefinite integral. It's actually rather pretty. Okay, so now let's just copy this down. And so we can say that's the limit, again, as that right-hand endpoint oops, goes to infinity of, okay, and then we can just put that in and I don't need the plus c because it would can immediately cancel out from 0 to t. Okay, so we've got a very explicit function. We're going to evaluate it at t and at 0, and then we're going to take the limit. And so if you're doing this carefully, that limit hangs around for quite a while and gets evaluated last. So we're going to get minus 1 over t squared plus 1. And this is where there's various ways you might be able to see this earlier and waste and not waste time the, but here is where we're going to see um, does this even does this limit actually even exist and we'll do other examples where we'll see that the limit does not exist it's totally possible there's lots of limits that don't exist you can try to set something like this up and just say oh the answer it, it diverges to infinity it diverges by oscillation that can really happen and that's a big issue with improper integrals simply does the limit does this limit converge in and we, we say that the way we say that is, does the integral converge? Okay, well, we're pretty much done. So finally, now this is just one, um, and this is the interesting limit, but this is a great limit to infinity at infinity to take. As t goes to infinity, t squared goes off to infinity, that square root goes to infinity, this whole thing goes to zero, and you just get a very nice answer, one. Okay, so the formal mathematical statement is this improper integral converges let me say that. So this is called an improper integral, and we're saying it converges and has value 1. There's going to be plenty of examples where the answer is simply, this doesn't converge, it does not define a number, just like a lots of limits we've always seen. Um, so let me just show you, uh, this, if you really don't want to see another way, you can stop now, but I want to show you a different way of doing the sub. I always think it's a bit clunky to go to the, imp the, the, the indefinite integral, but there's a little bit of clunkiness if you, if you do it in the definite integral situation. So we're going to do, I just want to show you that it's totally legal, we're going to do that same u sub. This is still 1 half du. This is still u to the 3 halves. Okay, and then what's the only other part of the u sub is that when x equals 0, then u, well, that's easy, u is 1 plus x squared, that's 1, and when x equals t, that happens to be this parameter, you can still change it, you can still write what u is, u is 1 plus t squared, that's totally legal. So, this is now the, the integral from 1 to 1 plus t squared. There's nothing really fundamentally weird about that. And I think some people think, ah, weird things in limits, that's all in, in endpoints of integrals. Ah, that's weird. Uh, that's another issue, um, the, the wording here. We often call the upper and lower endpoints of an integral limits, but 
that's never been that, that's never actually meant anything to do with our usual use of the word limit here. And here is our usual use of the word limit. So sometimes that can be quite confusing. Um, so some, I'll try to call these the endpoints of the integral. And then we're taking a limit with a variable endpoint. Okay. So um, now we can just, we can just let that limit hang out still. Oops. Not pressing a shift key there. Okay. And then you can do that um, integral. And you get back to exactly what we had before. This is going to be uh, minus 2u to the minus 1, or sorry, minus u to the minus 1 half, because it cancels. Very similar. Okay. And then just evaluate it at 1 and 1 plus t squared. There's nothing, nothing really weird about that. You're gonna, it just says you're going to plug that sucker in, and it get back, gets back to exactly the limit we had before of... Uh, minus 1 over root, 1 plus t squared, because you're just plugging that in, and then uh, plus 1. Okay. Um, so that's totally totally way to do it. If you're not that worried about putting somewhat slightly complicated things in the limits of that integral, you can totally do the strategy where you change everything, and then the, uh, the x variable never came back. The t, of course, comes back at the end, because that's really, that's that last quantity that we're using in order to take the limit.